usually when you come for interview, you will have two interviews. Uh, and that's true of, of, of most subjects. Um, for English, we uh, have one interview that's geared around the personal statement and the kinds of texts that you might have listed there. The other interview takes the form of reading with us. Can I say conversation rather than interview? The other conversation is about reading with us a short poem that we will have given you 10 minutes before. So you've got a bit of time to sit with it and um, write some things about it, have some thoughts about it. We always choose a poem that's in modern English, not something from Shakespeare. Um, we always choose a poem that's quite short and that we hope you won't have come across before. And that's really important. Now, there are no right answers for this conversation. It's simply a way of giving you something to have a time to read and then having a conversation to see what you thought about it, what you thought were the ideas the poem was talking about, what the issues were that it raised, and what did you think about the way in which the poet has crafted those thoughts and issues. So um, an interview usually lasts, sorry, conversation usually lasts about 20 minutes. And I'm indebted to young Miriam for being my timekeeper. <laughs> so you should have a clock behind, behind somebody. Um, so this will be a genuine interview insofar as we've not practiced. I have read the poem. <laughs> and I'm going to interview one of our current students who is doing a degree in English and French. So that's, that's I mean, so it's obviously, I, I thought I might ask one of you, but you might not have wanted to do it. <laughs> Though I have done that before. Anyway. Um, so I do know Chloe, though I haven't taught her for a year because she's been on her year abroad. Um, Chloe has had this poem for 10 minutes and she's never seen it before. So this is not something that we've rehearsed and staged. And apart from the fact that I do know Chloe, whereas I, you know, would be very unlikely to know anybody that I was having a conversation with, that's the only bit that's not authentic. Okay. So I've no idea what Chloe's going to say. And she, ha-ha, has got no idea what I'm going to say either. <laughs> so um, that'll be a lot of fun. Hello, are you Chloe? Hello, I am. Yes. May I shake your hand? Course, that one? Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Come, and, come, and, come and sit down. Come and have Thank a seat you. over here. Good. Have you, have you travelled far? Not too far. I actually live in Abingdon. So oh, okay. Disappointingly close. <laughs> right. And uh, have you been staying in college? Oh, yes, yeah, I've been staying in college in the lead up to my interviews, um, but it's just for a day so far. So. Okay, and how, how have you found it? Interesting, interesting. First time living in kind of university accommodation, and <laughs> it kind of feels, um, you know, what with the interviews and things like that, I feel like I should be preparing a lot, but just trying yes. to enjoy it as well, and kind of uh, walking around the garden, things like that, trying to keep myself calm. Yeah, good. And have you, have you met some of our current students? Yes, I have, the student helpers. Um, who are kind of always there to, in case I'm going in the wrong direction or whatever. Um, so they're there in the interview room as well, um, which is a massive help. Um, yeah. Kind of yeah, keeping yeah. you calm and just chatting to you before uh, the interview and things yes. like that. So that's really lovely. Good. And so they've told you what to expect, have they? An absolute horror story, yeah. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> just as long as you know. Um, <laughs> now, as you know, as you know, we're just going to have a conversation yeah. about this poem. Have you come across it before? No, never come across it. Okay, it's quite, a, it's quite a recent poem. Um, and when I say conversation, I do, I do mean conversation. And I know that you'll have only had that for, for, for 10 minutes. Yeah. And I'd just be interested to hear um, what you thought it was about, you know, what the issues are that the poem might raise. Um, and then we'll also have a conversation about its style okay. and the language that it uses. Yeah. So, so you, 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 you start yeah. off. Um, okay, so just to begin with kind of the title, um, Pheasant and Astronomers, uh, obviously kind of two 
two things that you don't often see together, um, kind of opposites there, contrasting things. Um, so, and also, I guess, like the pheasant being singular and the astronomers being plural, I find quite interesting in that kind of it instantly focuses on the one kind of a kind of really important part of the poem, which is this kind of pheasant, um, which kind of becomes this almost like legend or mythical beast, um, I find, in the poem. Um, in terms of like my general impressions, um, I found that it is very much a poem about kind of the voyeurism of nature mm. and art and things like that and things that don't belong in the office setting. So obviously mm. to set the scene of this poem, I kind of imagine someone working in an office. It makes reference to the office and kind of measures and projections and things like that. And the kind of uh, them observing this pheasant that seems very much not part of their everyday business world, maybe. Um, and kind mm. of being a bit fascinated by it. Um, mm. and that's what I kind of, that's what I get as a kind of overall impression of what the poem's about. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that you've got the office, as you say, yeah. and, then, and, and then you've got the outside world. And, and you, you pulled out the words measure and yeah. projections. What kind of world is it in the office, do you think? So I kind of guess the words measure and projection, they're kind of this world of productivity. When you get measure, you're doing something, you're actively measuring something. It can be active in that sense. Um, measure, also if you are a measured person, you're kind of thinking things through, you're perhaps not being, I suppose, particularly out there or particularly creative, you're reasonable mm -hmm. and reasoned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess projections also have the kind of double meaning, I guess, of sort of projections like you'd have uh, in a kind of um, a presentation, if you're showing things to a group mm -hmm. in an office meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but also in terms of projections and you're saying like, we, we assume these things are gonna happen in yeah. the future. So predicting kind of, I suppose, financial loss or gain or sales, revenue, that kind of thing, um, as well, I suppose, comes into it when you talk about the projections and shortfalls of a business and things like that. Yes, um, of, a, of, a, of a business. Mm. I hadn't thought of projections as, 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 as a sort of screen. That's, that's interesting. Um, and if and measure and, and counting and business models, mm. etc., and looking forward, what you think, what yeah. you think you can um, see ahead. Um, how does that work with uh, line six, which talks about as coarsest calculus to his most perfect curve? Yeah. So I found that line interesting, because um, from what I could see, it was a, I think it was as coarsest calculus to his most perfect curve. I think it was almost like an Alexandrian and split into two. Um, and so I found that interesting because it kind of became a bit of a focus um, of the poem. I suppose as coarsest calculus to his most perfect curve kind of disrupts the idea that everything in the office is neat and ordered and this idea of coarse calculus rather than perfect calculus. Yeah, and cal kind of, have you met calculus before? I can't say I have. That's, that's all right. Yeah. Um, I had to look it up when I first <laughs> saw this poem. Do, 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 do you know what kind of... Um, where you would f use the word calculus? Other than kind of... Other than kind of in terms of, like, sums of money. And yes, like sums. 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 Like that's what I would imagine. Yes. Um, and if I just, just yeah. pause you a moment, it's mathematical, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And is there another word in that line that possibly looks mathematical? In terms of the word curve, mm -hmm. you also have that idea, I suppose, of the curves, the graphs, and things like that. Um, who's, d d just pause you a moment, who's perv... Oh, perv, sorry. <laughs> who's... <laughs> Forgive me. Who's, cool. Whose curve is it? So I took it to mean, um, as coarsest calculus to his most perfect curve, the curve referring to the pheasant. Yes, because yes. Because I thought the curvature of the body and things like that is this idea that the, the calculus or the, the mathematics that are happening inside the office are coarse compared to the... I suppose a lot of, I hear people talk about the mathematics of nature as mm. well, and the maths within nature being something... Um, that obviously a lot of people are interested by biology mm. students, that kind of thing. They do see maths in nature. Um, mm. So I suppose it's just going to say the kind of maths that we do on the everyday is nothing compared to the maths and the kind of nature and art. Mm. Um, mm. Kind of, yeah. And if you let's let's if you think about that that perfect curve, yeah. um, let's go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Burnished, finicky, picking his head bob way across the asphalt path into the leafy scrub. How, 
what kind of figure of the pheasant do those lines suggest? Yeah. Um, so obviously, it kind of burnished begins in such a strong way. Yeah. Um, and kind of almost it's this idea of like a, almost like flaming kind of coming into you can't help but look. But then the finicky and the pinnocking and head bob way, the way it's kind of you know it's not it's in contrast to the the phrase his most perfect curve. Yes, it how is how is it how is it in contrast? Um, so it's in contrast in terms of its meaning. Yeah. Um, so I suppose the finicky, the picking his head bob way. You imagine him darting around a little bit. You imagine kind of I suppose jagged movements, um, mm. bobbing the head up and down. It's mm. kind of unpredictable. Um, unpredictable. Yeah. Unpredictable. And how does that compare? With uh, the, the the language of the you know the twelve pane window of our office and line yeah. three, and the whole actually of the second stanza. Yeah. So I suppose in a way it's like you've got the unpredictability of the pheasant, but then you've got the regularity and the daily grind almost of these twelve pane window, and the fact they mm. even go to the kind of to say not just behind the window of our office which they could do, they go behind the 12 pane window yes. of our office. Yes. And that almost gives it a certain heaviness, I think, as well, the 12 pane window. It kind of makes it seem so regular and mm. so fixed and so kind of created and kind of not natural. Yes. I mean, I would like to see, though I'm probably wrong, a pun on pain as in P-A-I-N, yeah. but I'm probably yeah. wrong. <laughs> Let's, um, just thinking of the office world, the... Um, <laughs> Let's, let's move on, shall we? Yeah. Um, so we observe. What do you think's going on between lines seven and nine? So, obviously, the, the curve and the observe on line seven is when you have kind of the only rhyme within the... Well, the only rhyme that I found um, within the poem. <laughs> um, so curve and observe. Um, so I kind of... The way you then have the, the only kind of full stop and a kind of broken line, mm -hmm. um, it kind of feels like this <coughs> moment of total appreciation and mm -hmm. pause. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of the only time in the poem where you kind of, you do think, all right, I can take a breath. You're not completely, in, you are engaged, but you're not kind of watching, you're not looking at something darting around, you take a pause. Um, and I imagine in terms of setting the scene and being in the office, is so we observe is almost the feeling of, wait, I'm actually going to take the time to look at this. Mm. And maybe, you know what, I'm going to put my pen down or I'm not going to finish doing that sum or that email or whatever. And mm. it is kind of thinking, right, this is, I'm going to watch this unapologetically um, mm. and just think about what this pheasant means um, mm. and its beauty and things like that. Mm. And what kind of job are the, are the people doing in the office uh, if you look at lines nine and eight? Nine and eight. So that. The midnight sky whose glaring spectral eyes sees down the universe shrinkage yeah. in a telescope. Yeah, those are um, quite hard lines, actually. Yeah. But <laughs> what, 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 what do you get from them? Um, so... I suppose in line nine, particularly, when it says sees down the inverse shrinkage of a telescope, obviously, you, I, you know, the word telescope is this idea of potentially some kind of laboratory or something. Yes. You've kind of got this kind of scientific, suddenly you've yes. gone away from office and business-like. And you've actually gone off into this kind of world of telescopes and invert, which makes you think instantly of like, I suppose, periscopes and mirrors and things like that, um, that invert images. Um, mm. So I suppose that then makes you think, OK, astronomers is coming into this because at the beginning you kind of think, OK, it's an office worker's daily grind. And then when you get to invert shrinkage of a telescope, which is just a higher level of language and much harder to kind of work out what it means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll just, I'll just pause you there, because is, this is such an interesting line. Yeah. Um, and when I read this poem, I was puzzling... I had to puzzle what it meant. Yeah. Um, if you look down a telescope, what happens to the object that you're seeing? So if you look through a telescope, it's to make the object you're seeing... So if you're looking at the moon or something like that, it brings it much closer to you, or the image is much more identifiable, so it kind of zooms in on it. Yeah, and so... Um, what, what does it do to its size? So it makes it much more... Makes it much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I think it makes it bigger, bigger doesn't yeah. it? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sorry to... I know, I know you're not, you know, reading... Come to do an interview about telescopes, but... Um, so shrinkage of a telescope. Um, yeah. And 
glaring spectral eyes. What, what, I mean, that's a, a metaphor, isn't it? You know, uh, um, saying something in, in different words. What do you think, actually describing the object, what do you think those could be? Imagine a midnight sky. So I suppose those glaring spectral eyes would be stars? Yes. That's how yes. I see it in the starry night sky. Yes, um, yes. And I suppose, oh, in, in which case you kind of think the midnight sky is... OK, so then it becomes the midnight sky is, is kind of, a, like, personified, I suppose. It has eyes, and those stars as eyes. And so it's the eyes then looking down the shrinkage of a telescope. So is it the stars then looking towards maybe Earth or kind of the human world? Mm. which kind of counters the human world looking at the pheasant. Mm. You suddenly get mm -mm. the kind of natural world looking at kind of the human world we create as well. Yes, yes. Um, and any thoughts about the use of the word glaring or spectral and seethe? OK. Um, so in terms of glaring... Um, obviously, if you say someone, if you, you know, if you were to give like a stage direction of glare at that person, you would think it's kind of almost an angry look, yes. kind of staring down in, in disappointment, in anger. Yes. Um, it's emotive. Um, so you think, well, then the eyes, they have emotion behind them. Mm -hmm. They're looking with feeling, and that feeling is not positive. That feeling is not, you know, whereas the eyes looking at the pheasant are thinking, wow, this pheasant's beautiful or amazing to look at or whatever. So you kind of think there's judgment there. Mm. from the, mm. the eyes of the star. Um, in terms of spectral, I kind of, I haven't seen this word much before, but I think it obviously makes me think of spectrum um, and kind oh of God. the colour spectrum <laughs> in terms of telescopes and things. It's the only other time, like, obviously in science lessons and things where I use spectrum and telescope and things like that. Gosh, um, that's, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of yeah. spectrum. Um, <laughs> um, if, if, you, if you replace the A-L with an E, what else do you get? I suppose you get the word Spectre. Spectre. Spectre, that's the one. Spectre. Um, but that's it? interesting. Do you know what a spectre? Have you, uh, oh, don't worry. It just means a ghost. <laughs> oh, oh, OK. Be, but yeah, it's interesting, but, you know, to, to put together a word that can suggest ghost yeah. and spectrum. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. I suppose it's the idea of, like, in that case, like, projected, like, phantom images or something yeah. like that. They yeah, aren't yeah. really there. The colours aren't really there, but they're just being projected. Um, interesting. Which is quite cool. Um, and then I guess the seethe down the invert shrinkage of a telescope. Seethe, again, I've only ever seen or heard the word seethe as in seething. Yes. Um, yeah. So, but I, it also gives the feeling, again, that matches with glaring. Yeah. And also, just seeing the word seethe, I don't, I could, as well as reading it, I was like, is it seeth? Is it seethe? Is it, so it kind of almost, I was like, oh, is it going down some kind of almost... I suppose, older version of English with the seeth, looketh, that kind of thing. Um, so that kind of caught me out there. Or I thought I put a question mark definitely yeah. by that because I thought yeah. it could be one or the other and maybe it's finding which one you prefer as a kind of um, uh, yeah. analysis. Yeah. I mean, it is actually from a, from a very early word, which means to boil, okay. but now it means more to boil over yeah. in, in anger. Um, let's, let's move on, shall we, because we, we've not looked at um, the last, the last uh, three, six lines. Um, let's just focus on the last stanza, shall we, because yeah. I, think, I, think, I think we may be running out of time. Um, what do you think is being expressed by that last stanza? What's it saying? So I kind of took it, because I see it as like quite a poem of, of opposites, and thinking if they're saying one thing, what is the opposite of that? And how does it apply to which world? Which side of the window does it apply to? So when it starts with on foot and unconcerned, he patters out of view. Obviously, that's, I, I imagine, describing the pheasant. And so I thought, well, if the pheasant, uh, the pheasant is on foot and unconcerned, what are the people in the office? And they're mm. sat in office chairs... And are they concerned about something? Is this a world of kind of that constantly being in your office chair, constantly being static and constantly being stressed out about things? And that mm. kind of... Because both worlds have stability and instability. Um, and the world of the office, even though it's stable and you're sat in your chair, it's still unstable because all of these calculations and all of the projections and things like that, probably you do get that, I suppose, 
that millennial feeling of, of being stressed out um, mm -hmm. uh, comes comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. um, and if I just if I just I could just pause you there. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying about the, you know, the the stress and yeah. the millennial and um, uh, the contrasting that uh, with the unconcerned pheasant. Yeah. What what do you think is being what do you see being expressed by the last line and a half? The sunlit room falls just a lumen dimmer with his passing. Have you come across lumen before? Only again in science lessons. Yes. It's about the lumen of an artery. Oh, like OK. Um, oh. So kind of the shape of it being circular and going further in. Is that... Oh, gosh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I hadn't come across the word okay. until I had to buy a light bulb. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it'd been a while. And okay. apparently they now have lumens, right? OK. So, I th but it is a scientific term. Yeah. But I yeah. think it's a measure of light. Okay. Yeah. So, know knowing that, yeah. um, what what do you see to be expressed by the last line and a half? So, when it says the sunlit room is just a lumen dimmer with his passing, it's it's important that the light doesn't completely go out. I think is you know it's not saying it's passed on and now it's hopeless and now it's dark and we're kind of you know. It, the way it says just a lumen dimmer, like the dimness is important. And I suppose with his passing, for me, that made me think of grief. Yes. And that made me think of the idea of, you know, with his passing, I'm so sorry he passed. You know, yes. those are kind of the, the most delicate way of saying, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, with his passing. And so I suppose in a way it was quite a hopeful, even though it ends on passing, it was a relatively hopeful Mm. ending for me because I thought well there's still light there there's still mm. plenty of light we can appreciate that it's dimmed a bit yeah. but hopefully something else might come along that mm -hmm. gauges the interest and I suppose it is often that idea of um, I know when I've spoken to people about grief and things like that they sometimes say oh goodness the, the weekend my you know, granddad passed away I kept seeing magpies everywhere or mm. I'm sure he was in that magpie or something like that and so I yeah. think perhaps it is that idea of thinking oh maybe that was that that was yes. someone I loved in, in that um, in that pheasant in spirit or something like that. Nice. Good, good. Um, let's just finish, shall we, thinking about the style of yeah. the poem. Um, first of all, do you have any, any thoughts about the number of lines there are? Okay, so there's fifteen lines mm. um, separated into five three line stanzas. Mm -hmm. um, and Obviously, there's a break in the middle mm -hmm. with the, his most perfect curve, so we observe. I mean, obviously, because when I was counting, I thought, well, perhaps it would be 14 lines or something and like why, that. Why would that be significant? Because then it would be a sonnet. Okay. So I was thinking, oh, well, maybe when I first saw it, I okay. thought, okay. Oh, okay, so it's not a sonnet. Yeah. But it made you think of a sonnet. It made me think of it. A sonnet. Yeah. Um, and what do, do, have you come across sonnets before? So I know there is a slight difference in how sonnets are. Sometimes can you have a nine and then a five? Yeah, or a I mean, in terms of, I mean, if you were, if you were to have a continuum of yeah. uh, formality of poetry, yeah. where would you place a sonnet with, with um, informal being at one end of the spectrum and formal at the other? So I'd say it was formal, because yeah. I suppose there are different, like there's Shakespearean sonnets and Petrarchan yeah, sonnets yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very formal style. Yes. Um, Yes. And in, in terms of, so we, we, we might be wanting, our expectations are this might be a sonnet, yeah. but it doesn't yeah. quite fit. And as you, you said, there, there's a line break, mm -hmm. interestingly, uh, in line seven. Tell me what you thought, we've, we've discussed, haven't we, um, words which have more than one meaning. Yeah. What did you, and you talked about the way in which curve and observe is the only full rhyme of, of, of the poem. When you were reading it, to what extent did you notice any other sound patterns or repetitions of sounds, but they weren't exactly rhymes? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I kind of noticed some similar sounds. Mm -hmm. So in terms of... I found it was often quite... So some words you had that were very, very strong, like I kind of put gutter and scrub. Mm -hmm. and uh, those Gutter words. and scrub. 
I suppose, like, not... Obviously, there's no kind of half rhyme there, but the similar sounds yeah. of gutter and scrub, they're harsher sounds. Um, and I kind of found that the that kind of um, contrasted with a lot of the softer sounds that were in the poem. Um, I suppose in terms of sounds that kind of come up again, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it's, it's just, um, let's, let's just have a look, shall yeah. we? Um, Bernie, let's look at this um, fourth stance, because we've not really looked at that, have yeah. we? Just in terms of the sound. Or does he sleep all clouded in the hedgerow straight line rays of green restraint to toads? And I've run out of breath, sorry. <laughs> um, what, would you, what would you say about the, the um, correspondence between hedgerows and toads? Yes. So I suppose like it's kind of, it has a similar... A similar, yes, it has a similar, a the similar sound. sound. Um, and yeah. Hedgerows and toes. It's exactly. Um, and that always makes it, as you said, you've run out of breath. It always makes it harder yes. to read aloud that whole full stanza because there is no punctuation other than at the end. Yes. And what do you think about line twelve? There's the, there are a couple of sound patterns there, aren't there? That sling his sloke in cockeyed in the gutter. Yeah, and it's hard to. It almost sounds like a kind of. Um, uh, which is like a mouth teaser, sort of kind of one. Where it's kind I know, of, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so, so, just it is like a mouth teaser. I can never do these. Yeah. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled yeah. poppers. <laughs> I don't think that's right, but anyway, um, pickled poppers is not right. Um, what's what's um, what's sound patterning? Can you see if you look at the initial um, letters of the words? So I would say, obviously, sling, yeah. and then slow kin. I suppose it takes and some if you of carry, the sound if you carry, if you carry on. Slow kin, cockeyed. Yeah. So what, what's, what's, what's happened there in the choice of letters? Um, <coughs> sling his slow Sorry. kin, cockeyed. Just in terms of the pattern. Sling. You said sling and slow, and what else have you got? And then... Sling slow, then kin and cockeye. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it is. It is, uh, it, it is like a. Sling slow, kin, cockeye. Yeah, yeah. 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 I see that. So it is like a tongue twister yeah. or a tongue teaser. You could easily. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in the poem as a whole, because I think we're probably um, running out of time. Mm. Why do you think a poem that's about a pheasant mm -hmm. and about astronomy? Yeah. Should have, and we have just haven't had time to tease them all out. Should have so much play with sound and meaning. I suppose. I think astronomers. So I suppose in the words pheasant and astronomers themselves, they're probably words that people might slip up on as sounds. <laughs> like I, I know I've said a couple of times pheasant and peasant mixed up in in kind of in not as bad as it. what I said. Um, but anyway, carry on. <laughs> um, astronomy, astronomy, astrology. Everyone gets confused with that. I know I do. Um, so I suppose they're words that people might trip up on anyway. So it's playing on this idea of words and their meanings and kind of the play of language and people getting mm -hmm. confused. But I suppose they're intricate things in themselves yes. as well. Like the way he discusses the pheasant as an intricate being, kind of also quite mysterious, and astronomy as a kind of, as a science, as an mm. intricate thing that requires mm. and demands language to describe itself mm. as well. Mm. Um, that would be my kind of initial reaction. Mm. And, and this, this, this play of um, both meaning and also sound, how does that, how does, when you think of the use of the word calculus in the mm. poem, what, what, do you, what, what sort of conversation is being set up between play and sound and calculus, do you think? I suppose it's the idea that, I would say, because obviously there is something in, one man's calculus is another person's play. Like, you know what I mean? There is that idea. <laughs> nice. it's, it's, it kind of, there is that, I suppose, yes, and you can, yeah. you can play with it. But I suppose the difference between the calculus and the play in terms of a kind of, it's the strictness, perhaps, of it. It's yeah. this idea that when you have calculus, you have a formula, you have a path that yes. you follow, that you follow probably each and every time you do that. Yes, and does uh, the, I'm just going to interrupt you, yeah. sorry, <laughs> pardon me for being rude. So, so you have a formula and a path that you follow. Yeah. How far does the poem do that? And I suppose 
it's aware that there's a fall. So it has the kind of five three-line stanzas. It has some kind of uh, Alexandrines within it. But I think it's also aware that it's kind of going to purposefully confuse that and purposefully play on it and say, you know, I could do this because I know... I know how poems work. I know how I can kind of write one, but I'm purposely not going to do that because it's what you're expecting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for, for discussing this poem. Um, there will be a, um, a student ambassador at the door to, to take you back into college. Okay. And, and please don't get, do go and get yourself some tea. Lovely to meet you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Pleasure. How did you... T tell me what your experience of that was. Um, so, I think having done one interview, you know, kind of in the real, um, kind of trying to get into Oxford versus doing this one, I kind of understood, by thinking about what I wanted to show an audience of kind of prospective students, my experience of that was just be honest and be yes. yourself. Yes. And there were definitely things that I kind of was confused on or didn't know or kind yeah. of had to kind of talk around so that you could ask another question that <laughs> helped me in the, you know, um, and sometimes I had to ask a question that kind of yes. helped me to know what, what to say. Um, so I definitely think the main thing is if you like literature and if you like English, that was an enjoyable 20 minutes of talking through a poem. It wasn't stressful. There were no questions there that I thought this is unanswerable. Um, so... Some of the questions could have been phrased more simply. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I say that because um, while an interviewer will always want to use the simplest language possible, it's part of our trade to use um, unintelligible vocabulary. <laughs> and sometimes it's difficult to remember not to do so. OK, so that's, that's, re that's really important. I was aware I rephrased one of my questions because I thought that's a bit pretentious. Um, if, you, if somebody asks you something that's quite complicated and you're not really sure what they're asking, please do ask, oh, uh, could, could, you, could you just say a little bit more what you mean by that? Because don't assume that it's you not understanding. Sometimes, as I've shown, an interviewer may not ask the question in the way they most would have liked to have asked it. And that's really important, uh, especially when you've got an audience <laughs> watching you. Um, what, how did you feel your understanding of the poem? Um, what, what did you feel about your understanding of the poem before the interview and after it? Um, so certainly before we'd had our conversation, I was sat back there thinking, oh, could it be this? Might it be this? And you do certainly think, oh, is Helen suddenly going to turn around and say something that I've never thought of before, or maybe I've completely misjudged this. Um, but in terms of my basic understanding, we talked about a lot of the things. I felt like you let me lead the interview um, really nicely. Um, and then you were able to kind of go off what I'd said and draw it out of me a bit more. So I think I'm certainly more confident in terms of my understanding of that poem and also that there is worth in my answers as well. Um, and that you I do realise you're completely wrong, don't you? <laughs> Worth in your answers? What yeah, heresy is this? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I certainly think, um, <laughs> like anything, once you've had the conversation about it and put things yes. out there, I certainly feel much more confident. You know, if I were to have to write an essay on it before speaking to you and after, I certainly feel now I'd be in the best position possible yeah. to do so. And the reason, the reason I asked that question um, of, of Chloe just now is that um, if you use the word interview... It suggests that you're being grilled, that you're being interrogated, that, you know, stuff's being yanked out of you. I mean, police interview you. Who else interviews? Can't think. Academics, that's terrible, isn't it? Police <laughs> and academics. Um, what we were doing there is more like what would happen in a tutorial. Only in a tutorial, it'd be better because there'd be one more of... There'd be more than one student, which is always a good idea. <laughs> um, so, and that's that's... You know, if you can think of uh, coming for um, a conversation that's more like a tutorial, I hope that that might be a, an easier way to frame what's, what's happening. And, and those couple of occasions when you asked me about the meaning of a word, spectral and lumen um, and, and also projection, 
I was being utterly genuine when I said that I hadn't thought of those things. And you'll notice that I nudged you slightly sideways with yeah. Lumen because it wasn't quite <laughs> appropriate. Yeah. It didn't matter. It was, you were yeah. thinking. Um, why do you think sometimes I sort of paused you? Or sometimes, very rudely, I interrupted you. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I think because it's supposed to be a conversation. And I think the, everyone has that thing when they're asked to talk about a poem. You just go into overdrive and you think, and then I thought this and then I thought that. And actually, it's, it's not. The whole point is that it's a conversation and that kind of, you'll certainly stop me, especially if I've said something that you'd like to know more about. Or if you said something wrong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've said something really terrible. Both, no, no, both of well. those, both yeah. of those things. I think having had a few years of tutorials, I certainly know that my best answers are the ones that I reflect on before I immediately just jump to yes. say something. Yeah, um, I mean, that's really important. And, and, and also it's important, I think, when you're asked something, if you, if you do take a measured pause... Your answers don't have to be quite as long as I think sometimes yours were. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes I felt I couldn't quite get in yeah. because, because your answer was a bit fuller than it yeah. needed to. There's nothing wrong, but just a bit fuller than it needed yeah. to be. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, that happens so often, should I just say that? happens really often, and especially when you're being watched. Um, a lot of... Uh, I, I've had a lot of students sit down and, and they've just, you haven't done this, but they've just charged at me like full, like a train. <laughs> and I've just wanted to <laughs> do this. Um, and it's because they want to show that they're keen, they want to show that they're passionate, and also they're nervous. So it's completely understandable. But if you hear the person having a conversation with you saying, oh, um, let's just pause a bit, shall we, and th think about that. That's code. <laughs> That's code for, um, let's, let's, just, let's just slow it down, let's turn the dial down a wee bit. Um, and if the code isn't picked up, and I think somebody may not be, and this doesn't refer to you, uh, may not be doing themselves justice because they're going off on one single idea, I might say... OK, so we've talked about that, and I can, I can see why you're interested in that. Shall we, shall we just pause a moment? Just, just take a breath. What other things do you think it might be? And again, that's because if I, if I don't do that, somebody may just go off on an idea, and therefore they can't come back and discuss something else. Yeah. Now, you did this a little bit with The Office, uh, just a little bit. I was trying to steer you ineffectively. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to say, astronomy, <laughs> science lab. Um, yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't quite get you yeah. there. But it didn't matter. Yeah. didn't matter. I mean, there were loads and loads of things that you pulled out of this poem which showed that you were really thinking about its language. Um, if you needed to have a little bit of information, like the meaning of a word or nudged in a sonnet wood direction, <laughs> you made something of it yeah. and you came out with really interesting things. And so the fact that um, I had to yank you away from office and it yeah. didn't work doesn't matter a whit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if I had um, a conversation with a student who came in with that um, zest and willingness to, to work through something and to listen, I'd think, oh, I'd really like to have a tutorial with them. You might not think the same, but never mind. <laughs> Are there any questions? We, we, we make sure that it's a poem, partly because it's short, and there will always be some lines that are quite difficult, <laughs> as well as some that aren't. I deliberately didn't take us through. There's, there's uh, lines 10 to 13 here are really hard, and I'd actually sort of forgotten that when I chose the poem, because uh, I think there's definitely line 11 is, is difficult. Had you wanted to talk about that, yeah. I, I would have said, uh, actually, I think this is really difficult. What, what, what do you make of it? Yeah. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't think I would choose this for interview for that reason. 
I might, I might choose something that's like this, though possibly without that uh, uh, 10 to 30. Because I don't want somebody coming in thinking, oh, God, what if she asks me about line 11? <laughs> I'd rather be thinking uh, that you wouldn't be bothered with that. Yeah, um, I, I always try to, to phrase it, what did you think was interesting about this? What did you think it was saying? To try to encourage somebody to talk about what they think the poem's about. Yeah. Uh, again, I've noticed that sometimes people will come in, uh, and I, you know, I was looking through my notes, interview notes from last year, and you have a poem like this, and I'll ask that question, and they will say, oh, um, there's, there's quite a lot of sibilance, I, repetition of S sounds. And they will go on about sibilance, sometimes about punctuation. And that may, they may be making very, very good points. But they're going into the detail without having given me a sense that they have some understanding of the poem. And we're not looking for, you know, a complete analysis of it, it couldn't, wouldn't be possible, but that they are thinking about what it means. Uh, and that's partly because the way in which English is taught often at schools, you get to learn various technical vocabulary, yeah? And often there's the sense that may, you may have, which you need to show knowledge of that technical vocabulary. So you work through the poem, you say, oh, there, there's some assonance, there's some Alexandrines, yeah. which are... 12 beats. Well done. Um, <laughs> there's some sibilance. Uh, there's alliteration. And that's fine, except only mention those things if you've got something to say about it. Um, and and the, 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 the one thing that's generally not a good idea is to say, oh, there's lots of sibilance, lots of S sounds, so there's clearly a snake running through the poem. <laughs> But, but, you know, I, I, ideally, I'd have liked to have spent a little bit more time thinking about the sounds and the language. Yeah. Um, but we, we did enough. And I thought your final, final response was really great. Yeah. You will always have two interviewers. But I don't have any friends and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> Um, and that's because some, some, one person might be more focused on just jotting things down uh, or not. But, uh, you know, we'd always say at the start of the interview, we'd say who we were. I forgot to say who I was. Never mind. Um, I do know something. Um, but you know anyway. The, um, we, would, we would introduce ourselves and we would say, um, supposing my colleague Sophie was here, uh, Sophie will start off uh, with, with conversation with you um, and, and I will come in a little bit later on. So you're not doing that thing of looking backwards and forwards thinking who's going to speak next? Who should I be looking at? Um, and it's actually not more kind of scary to have two interviewers. It actually makes it much more of a relaxing environment yes. because you tend to get the interplay between everyone rather than a one-on-one. -on -one. I actually found it because often you can have a postgraduate sometimes in interviews or things like yes. that, a PhD student. And so actually I found they were kind of, it felt like more people were on your side yes. um, when you had two interviewers rather than just 1v1 or anything like that. Exactly. Um, so it's actually more, it's actually better. Yeah. And it does sometimes, depend, you know, it really does turn into a three-way conversation. Yeah. Oh, the way in which we discussed it, yes. Um, usually, I think, um, you would have studied whatever we're looking at beforehand. I mean, I can't think now, compared with the past, that somebody would come in and I would just say, right, I'm going to have a conversation about that. So you would have had time and hopefully more than 10 minutes yeah. uh, <laughs> if you've prepared properly uh, <laughs> to have the conversation. <laughs>